So this scenario um, is called uh, Keep of the Blood Countess. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about is where some of the inspiration for this process comes from. It comes from a few places. Um, one is uh, my other hockey besides role-playing games is I read a lot of Gothic literature. And a lot of people are very familiar with sort of the more Victorian era style stuff like Dracula and all that stuff. But um, uh, the genre is actually much older than that. And the, the, first, the first wave of um, like the height of the first wave of Gothic eras was actually the 1790s. It's funny because, you know, I make the joke that, yeah, I'm into the height of the goth movement in the 90s, the 1790s. Um, and uh, there was a woman at the time who was sort of like, at least recognized today as kind of like the queen of the genre at the time by, uh, and her name is Anne Radcliffe. And when you read an Anne Radcliffe gothic novel, I found it funny because I noticed that there's actually more like legit dungeon crawling in a Anne, Rand, uh, Anne Radcliffe gothic novel than there is in most fantasy stories. Uh, basically, you have these heroines that are taken away to some creepy castle and uh, they are super good at finding secret doors, strange documents, <laughs> skeletons in closets. Um, there's actually, there, uh, uh, Anne Radcliffe was famous for something that is called the uh, explained supernatural. So there aren't even any supernatural elements. Everything in her stories that appear to be supernatural ultimately has some mundane explanation. But really, there are these stories about exploring places and discovering the dark history and the, and the past and everything like that, that ultimately kind of comes back and is, turns out to be like related to the heroine personally or something like that. Um, another, if you've ever looked at the game, another source of inspiration um, is the game Dogs in the Vineyard. I don't know if you've ever looked at that. Uh, Dogs in the Vineyard has this great town creation process in it that sort of builds up like the history of like somebody has pride and then they commit sin and eventually there's sorcerers and murder. Um, and a third influence on all of this is a very recent game called Bluebeard's Bride, um, which is all the players are playing the psychological components of um, one of the brides of Bluebeard from the fairy tale. And it is functionally a dungeon crawl. You are exploring this creepy mansion, but it's all focused on, on essentially, it's all kind of a weird metaphor for abuse, basically, for, you know, the terrible things men do to women uh, in abusive relationships. Um, and so uh, that's kind of been the evolution of this process. And I eventually decided to kind of, this is kind of what I was doing instinctually, but I really sat down and thought about it and said, and came up with a step-by-step -step process. So here you see my, my, my six steps. The first step is that every place, every place was built for a reason. Like dungeons just don't exist in, in thin air. Um, right right like like somebody built a temple or a library or in this case a house and here it was it was built by this man who was deeply in love with his wife jasna he built this refuge right which is why there's all this iconography to use the beauty there's a garden there's there's a tea room that is for her right there's right everything in this house is 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 about her and her being this love of his life the second step that I call something bad happens here. And that is essentially something happens that eventually causes some kind of tragedy that is the reason that this place is now a ruin. Why is it abandoned? Why is it empty? Why has it fallen apart? And in this case, um, it's a little complicated, um, but basically uh, this Count Gaspar becomes so obsessed with his wife's beauty uh, he wants to preserve her youth forever. So he conjures up a demon and he says, you know, what can I give you to, you know, to preserve my wife's beauty forever? And the demon says, well, let me, uh, let me father her first child. So the demon shapeshifts to appear to her husband to sleep with her every night until she gives birth to this child that is clearly of demonic origins, which is various. She realizes what has happened to her, that she's been tricked, that her husband has been dealing with demons, that all these things. 
So before the demon can take the child, uh, she basically uses her own husband as a human sacrifice to steal the demon away. So that's what's actually down in the basement. If you were to go down into the basement of this dungeon, Gaspar's body is like crucified across the doorway. And on the other side of that doorway is, is this demon that's still looking for his son, Varius, locked away in the basement. But that's why. And then, of course, she goes into town to try and like maintain her life. The townspeople freak out seal her away in this keep, and that is why the keep is falling to ruin. Eventually she dies, but the demon's curse or blessing or whatever that, that Gaspar originally bargained for takes place, and she awakens as a vampire that is now blood-hungry. Um, in fact, that kind of shades into step three. Step three is I call something lingers, which is essentially there's this tragedy that occurs for things we all understand as people. I'm obsessed with my wife's beauty. I make a dark bargain to prefer toxic masculinity, as Tracy pointed out, right? It's caused this downfall. And that sort of, in my mind, spawns a monster or there's some remnant left. So that's step three, something lingers. So in this case, what lingers is the vampire Jasna, Jasna and her half-demon son, Varius, are trapped in his key. Step four is called the space that's reappropriated. Some outside force comes to the location and wants to use it for some other purpose. So in this case, that's Tristan. Tristan the bandit arrives and says, ah, I need a new hideout. There's this keep that's been walled up and sealed up. He opens up the back, which as I remember as you guys were scouting out, I said there was a section of window where the bricks had been removed. He goes inside because that's what he wants to do. He's like, cool, new hideout for me and my dad. Step five is called the bad interaction, which is essentially this new thing that has uh, repurposed the space, encounters the thing that lingers or something else inside from the keep's history and, some, and creates a new, bigger problem. Um, whether that's them coming into conflict, whether that's one appropriating the other for a new purpose, um, but in some ways, the, 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 two, the two halves meet and create a bigger problem. In this case, Tristan discovers that, hey, when this vampire that lives here feeds, these strange vampiric children are born. Um, and, um, and Various realizes, oh, you know, I can have siblings. I've been alone all my life. You know, this is a chance to have siblings. But the children are, are unstable. They don't, they, they fall apart around the time, they age very rapidly and fall apart around the time they reach age 10. Um, so Various wants to figure out how to save his siblings. Tristan wants to figure out how to use these things. The vampire is stuck in the middle of all of this. Um, and then that's finally we get to six, seven, which is that the problem now starts exceeding just the place, right? That's when we have Tristan delivering these babies to wealthy homes, people, their whole families are getting wiped out. Tristan feeling all the stuff. Um, and that sort of gives the, the whole backstory to the place. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any like questions on my thoughts on, the, on this on this process? Because this is like kind of like how you like lay out like what a place is about in my mind to create these sort of complicated, more emotionally engaging you know, this is more than just like, you know, there's a lizard man temple that's kidnapping people, right? Like this is a place that's alive, it's dynamic. Characters that live there have motives, right? Um, no, no, it all makes good sense to me. Yeah. Okay. What, I, what I like about it is that it it has that kind of kind of 18th and 19th century sort of flavor to it. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking of uh, you know, uh, what's his name, um, Caspar Friedrich, the uh, Gothic painter. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, yeah. The, this sort of creates that kind of tone or mood. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. This tends to, and again, because one of my primary sources are those old school Gothics. That's kind of where a lot of this, a lot of this. So yeah, you're going to end up with a very fraught, sort of Gothic-y feeling place. So then we come to the keep itself. Um, I like using, if I'm not running like D and D where I literally need to know, <laughs> like this is a 20 by 20 room and you know, this is where everything is. 
Um, I just use these abstract node maps. Um, and what's nice about these maps is, um, is they let me organize, they let me turn the dungeon into a narrative structure. Um, because uh, they have interesting features. One feature I like to identify is once I have these node maps, and I actually, some of them sometimes generate them randomly. I generated this using a random process, um, is, uh, is entrances. And I think about entrances as essentially like different ways to start your narrative experience. Um, in this case, there are three obvious entrances, uh, and I, you know, I make a note to this. Technically, if you guys really wanted to like pick a random window, let's go through anything. Like I would have let you do that, right? Like, and then decided like what other room it led into. But essentially, the three obvious entrances are the front door. Now, if you come through the front door, the front hall has two of those like basically two of those like deflated uh, leathery remains of the children on the floor, and there's these blood stains. You would have been immediately confronted with the horror of this place, like the weird, like, whoa, what is going on here? If you'd gone through the opening I described or gone up and listened, you would have immediately, because that goes directly into the library, you would have immediately been confronted with uh, overhearing Tristan talking to his people. You would have been immediately confronted with a uh, more human element. Oh, there's bandits here. Uh, they're planning something. Uh, you would have heard, I think I would have introduced the idea of like some of them have gone missing, but they don't know why they've gone missing. So, you know, something's up. Uh, but but rather than being confronted with the horror, you would have been confronted with the entirely human side of things. There's just Tristan. You guys went up in the veranda. And the veranda starts you with the more direct heart into the tragic backstory of Barrios and I'm lonely and these are my siblings and I'm trying to care for my mom. So there's three different sort of viewpoints on what is going on here, depending on which entrance you go into. So entrances to me are like, how do I want to start, you know, the players interacting with it? And, you know, or do I want to give them choices? Because you get three very different viewpoints, depending on which way you go in. Um, a second feature I like to look for on these maps are, are, are node clusters. So on my, if you can see my first floor, which is the largest floor, has sort of like this little four grouping here, and this little sort of two grouping and maybe kind of eight if you think about it. And I look at those, those, those clusters and I kind of think of them like, I don't, I don't like using the word chapter, but they're definitely topical to me. Um, so nodes two and three would have been the, the dining and the kitchen and node eight is of course the library. So that's all banded themed. Going into those rooms, you would have, uh, you would have encountered purely the banded stuff. Oh, they're using the kitchens. They've got a camp in the library. You know, uh, uh, they've clearly moved in here and are clearly living here. Uh, Nodes six, four, and seven, and somewhat of one are more about uh, uh, are more about the children, right? You met the demon children in the chapel. The garden uh, shows evidence of being tended to, so you know that people have been here for a long time. Uh, first, the seven is the stairwell that goes up. Five is where sort of the bandits and the and the and the children narrative begin to sort of meet, because you start seeing like, oh, the portrait of the father's destroyed. There's the sketchbook, which if you looked at, would have some early children's drawings that various did. But of course, you also encounter the trap. That the bandits have put to warn themselves. You encounter the pit trap that the, the bandits built. Um, so I look at these little node clusters and I go, what do I, what, what more of the story or the environment do I want to tell in that? Same thing with upstairs. Upstairs, it's all kind of one cluster, but I sort of broke it in half. The upper half is more about various and his experiments. The lower half is more about Jasna, you know, and her and her and her life. Um, and of course, if you get down to the basement, it's all one cluster. And if you've gone down there, it's all about the demon. It's all about Philandros. It's all about Gaspar's dealings with the demon uh, to preserve his wife's beauty forever. A third feature I look for is what I call, what I call critical paths, which are essentially what must you encounter 
on the way from one point to another. Um, this map is so connected. It's actually, there's not many of them. Kind of like you could come in one and get virtually anywhere. <laughs> like, like there isn't a lot here. Um, I did observe um, that while the stairwell would be locked, um, it would be still harder to get to the stairwell without passing through either the garden or the chapel. Um, upstairs was a little easier to divide uh, because I wanted you to encounter some evidence of Various' experiments before encountering Various. So Various is, of course, hanging out in node three. And to get to node three, you either have to pass through node two or even coming in through the veranda, which is the five to one connection, you would have to pass through his workshop. So um, I look at things, same thing here. You can't get to Jasna without passing through her showing her that she was once a very gentle woman who appreciated fine things, right? The teacups, the silver tea sets, the lovely calming soother rooms, right? You, you, so I look at, I look at the relationships between rooms, right? And say like, oh, in order to get here, you have to have gone through these other rooms. You can't get to this room without experiencing these other things, which allows me to build, right? A kind of narrative experience out of the structure of the dungeon itself. Um, and then the last thing I look for, um, I call outlier nodes, which are essentially, what's the, what are the things that are the furthest away, uh, from any of these entrances or paths? And of course, in this case, that would be things like various and Jasmine's room. You have to go through, you can't just go directly to them. You have to at least experience something else before mm -hmm. encountering them. Uh, of course, the same thing with the basement. The basement itself is essentially a cluster, an entire cluster that you have to encounter at least the bandits, like the shortest possible path to the basement would have been, you know, through the front door into the kitchens, right? You would have heard the bandits in the thing, and then you could have discovered the hidden cellar door that's been locked up down into the basement. Um, there's a, you can't even, like this room, this four room here, I, I, I describe as being filled with like rats. You would have to have dealt with rats. You would have definitely a sense of like dread. And so I put, I put the supernatural heart of the problem. Like Tristan is the mortal problem and he's fairly accessible right away, but sort of like the real heart of darkness of the tragic backstory, I put as far away from any of the entrances as possible um, so that so that you get the most build up of dread and creep and problem before encountering it um, so i generally in those outlier nodes i generally like to put um Things that would really change your perspective on things. It's like, it's easy to get to the surface. Oh, Tristan is using things, but like something that would give you the true deeper understanding of what really happened here or what's going on. Um, I put kind of far, as far away as possible, again, sort of encourage exploration so that no matter what you do immediately, there's always sort of an unanswered question. Like, well, you know, she said something creepy in the basement, like, well, what's going on? Um, so those are sort of the four structural features I look for in a dungeon craft to, I hate using the word tell the story, but it's more like reveal the, the story of the location. Uh, yeah, and, and I think one of the things that, that is handled very well with this is that, um, and, and it's something else that uh, I think uh, is, is great about Dogs in the Vineyard is that I mean, you, you certainly have uh, this exploration and this kind of mystery, but but it's kind of set up so that that the players, if they work at it, that that they will get the the a lot of the kind of big pieces revealed to them, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then and then you know you have, uh, you know, with with that, then the the players have like the next level of challenge, which is that, okay, we piece this together and we figure out what's going on, but then it's like, well, and what do we do about that? And and one of the mm -hmm. things that I think makes it really interesting is that there's not really, um, I mean, I'm still kind of like in my mind thinking about, well, 
I mean, dealing with Tristan uh, is, is I think, the easy part of this. But, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you have a certain kind of empathy for and a kind of understanding of what's going on with Various and Jasna. And that's kind of a, a, a difficult uh, problem, I think, to deal with. I mean, especially right. with, with Various, uh, who who has, uh, I mean, this demonic background, but but doesn't, you know, strike you as being, you know, just merely evil, right? I mean, that, that there's a kind of, uh, that there's a, a, a thought process and, uh, you know, a, a kind of rationality behind what it is that he's been doing. Yeah, right. My, my, if you'll notice, part of the key to all of this that I was really you know, focused on when I was writing this was that it's a vampire story where the vampire has been nothing but a victim from start to finish. Right. Right. Um, so in some sense, the quote, most monstrous thing in the adventure is in fact just been abused. Right. <laughs> like, like that's, you know, that's, so you end up with this problem of, uh, yeah, what do we do about that? Right. Like, um, um, but I mean, it all comes from sort of the emotional core of what this process gives you, right? This process gives you like, what is this place about? And one of the things that I talk about in the section of the zine about the campaign section where I talk about, well, how do you do this at the campaign level? Uh, like if you're running like more than just one adventure is the nice thing about this process is that you can do this without ever drawing a map, right? You can, you can, you can come up with five of these, right? And you can only need to commit to the details when the players go, yeah, let's deal with that problem. So it becomes super easy to just keep throwing problem after problem after problem where they're like, oh, well, this is happening. And then if these things that where it gets, where it gets the boiling out in the world, if those things start interacting in bad ways. Like, I don't know, maybe there's some other keep where there's like, you know, I don't know, vampire hunters or something. And now they're just going around like killing people that aren't vampires because they think there's some cult that's built up around to like do a whole thing about undead some temple to some undead slayers that have gone wrong. And now there's, a, you know, like, you know, now there's some problem where th these people are running around killing innocent people because they think there's vampires on the loose because of the right? You can, you can very, very quickly build dungeons and their problems without worrying about the details. Uh, is there something you would have, I'm out of curiosity, like what do you feel like you would have wanted in these notes to help do what I was doing? Yeah. So like, because, I mean, I, I think it, it's probably, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but like when I play a game now, I'm always looking for stuff that I can steal to use in the classroom. Sure. And I think what was like most, what, what was most intriguing for me while we were playing this was that turn that like, you know, we, we first learn about Tristan and he's like, oh, you know, he's robbing from the rich, he's giving to the poor. Um, mm -hmm. And as we go along, we learn, oh, well, you know, actually the way he's robbing from the rich is that he's kind of like forcefully creating these vampire children and like, mm -hmm. and then you start to, you meet various, and you start to really feel for various, like he feels like, um, in fact, like I hadn't even thought about it being this like really, I mean, it felt like you felt bad for him. But then th this time Tracy brought up the fact that like, this is kind of a codependent relationship. And I was like, oh, yeah, right, right. I thought that was very interesting. That was very, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, but like that, that's the kind of stuff that I think as, you know, again, as someone who like reads games to see what I can steal, it's those types of ideas that like I would be looking for. Like, because the way that you ran it, like Various was a super sympathetic character and and in the end, when we met Tristan, like he was the dick that we thought he was going to be. Right. Like, so, but, but that didn't seem to appear in the notes, and that's why I was wondering if that was something that you riffed on, or if that was something you'd planned all along and maybe just didn't make it into the notes. I think it kind of didn't make it into my notes. I mean, it, my my whole thing about Trist Various is that he's lonely, cares about his mother. Like, actually, that's probably something I would add to a published version of this is like a character profile section that goes into more detail about like, here's Various and here's like, cause like one thing like I was kind of making up was like, well, Various is like kind of half demon, like what are his abilities, right? And it was only in that moment where like you came in with the light, I was like, oh, well, he's like demonic. He can like make darkness and throw fireballs. And like, you know, like I kind of made that up in the moment, but I'd always sort of had this vague sense that he would have some sort of demonic power inherited from his, 
demon parent. I just kind of didn't know what, but I might give more thought to that. So I'd probably give deeper character profiles because, yeah, because my thought, my, the, the emotional beats are various is that he cares about his mom, he's lonely, and he's discovered siblings for the first time, right? And he's obsessed with this idea of, I don't have to be alone, right? Um, Jasna is effectively sick, right? Most of the time she's been ill. She's been sort of living in this half-life, half-death. She's been, she's been very much abused. She's very angry. She cares about her son, but is very mad about what happened to her, but sort of just exists in a state of hunger. Um, you know, she's, she's, she, you know, sacrificed her own husband to keep the demon, you know, at bay in the, in the basement. Um, so she does get a little bit of revenge in the backstory. Uh, Tristan to me is obsessed with trade-offs. Right? He's like, well, when we raid a caravan, some of my people die, some of their guards die, some of their guards get injured, I, some of my guys get injured. Like, the amount of bloodshed to trade off to him is way lower in this case. It's like, all right, I kill one, one guy and I can take out a whole, like what I would normally take out in an entire merchant caravan, I can do that in one night for the cost of one dude, right? Like... <laughs> Um, I remember using this to teach, like, and this might betray what I think of Tristan and what I think of utilitarianism. Like, Tristan would be my utilitarian. Like, he's I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're just weighing up, like, cost and benefit here. Like, who cares about the individual? It's all about the, the maximum benefit. And so right. yeah. that's the kind of thing where, again, like, I'm playing this, I'm like, oh, I can use that, you know? So, yeah. 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 I, I, I think that the, the intentionality of what is written and what is presented is is uh, is embedded within the structure right um yeah. i could imagine a group of players who are wired somewhat differently than the four of us are mm -hmm. perhaps taking this into territory that you did not attend jesse like so, what like agreeing with tristan sure. yeah 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 i but mean yeah. even as yeah. Even as we were getting towards the end and I was thinking like, I don't agree with the way Tristan's doing things, you know, Ryan had said it like, because you can't do revolution right, you're doing this. But I kept thinking, well, but if we kill Tristan and stop what he's doing, and then we just go back to our daily lives and we let the wealthy get wealthy and, and mm -hmm. no one's providing anything for the poor then. And like, we're the good guys? No. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. No, I ab absolutely. This is intended to be. I have. I have no agenda here in terms of the outcome. Like, if if, if the player, if you guys went in here and went, there's a vampire and a demon kid, and the cleric and the paladin are holy, righteous, undead slayers, and all you did was go upstairs and murder them, then that's what you do. You go upstairs and you cleanse the unholy, and you know, pat Tristan on the back and say, "Sorry, I'm not going to let you weaponize." You know you know, the unnatural, but go about your day, sir, good luck, right? Like, that's a perfectly legitimate outcome, in my opinion. Uh, another perfect legitimate outcome is to just murder Hobo the place. You're like, oh, this is a wealthy place. Let's just, you know, we'll kill the bandits, we'll, 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 we'll slaughter the undead, and we'll loot the place and go home and sell off the silver tea set, right? The entire purpose of this is to give basic D&D-style play a little more meaning without really caring about how you're doing it, right? Like, you could go through here and murder Hogro. It's not going to break anything. You could go in here and, and side with Tristan. It's not going to break anything, right? It's it, it, it all, all you do is end up with an experiment where you go, huh, interesting choices. <laughs> right? Like, there's no... There's no moral imperative from my end because this is an experiment. This isn't, that's, that's the dilemma, right? Like, what do you do with this mess, right? And I just go, huh, it's interesting. Definitely, <laughs> it's definitely a productive mess to Tracy's point, right? Well, it seems self-evident that we should take out Tristan, which then destroys the, the social network, the social net, of the poor in this town, which can't be a goal that we would aspire to. But if we let him do what he's doing, then we're complicit in, and, and so it's nicely complicated, right? Um, Jesse, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to push back a little bit that there is no, that, that there's more framing here that you've given us than perhaps maybe you, you, you think, you know, the way that Tristan and Jasna are, were presented by you, it's, it would be disordered to me to then after having that say, well, okay, we're going to come to the conclusion that we ought to kill them. Now, mind you, the, 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 the dungeon as designed will, would let anyone do that, right? But mm -hmm. I would view that as a very strange place for a normal party to go. Now, maybe they never talk to them, right? Right. You never right. ever get that. They, they are yeah. righteous in the defense yep. of the living against the dead, and they view them as demons and undead, totally easy to do, right? Yeah. And even if Varys is trying to make this case, oh, demons lie and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the framework is really productively interesting from a- You are, yeah, you are a very talky group. Um, like, especially yeah, with Paladin's well, initial- Yeah. Philosophy philosophy professor. Right. Um, I could, easy, I, could e I could easily imagine a case of the rogue goes up to the veranda, right? You go into the tea room, you see the double, the lock double doors go, ah, something is important here, right? You unlock the doors, you find this pregnant, hungry, ravaging vampire and go, oh my God, stake it now. Like without like no, you know, no, you know, no thought, no, no nothing, right? Like, right? 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 Like, you know, it kind of... But right. we still, oh, we still yeah. would have known the backstory, right? That this woman had been like shown up with this demon baby and shoved out of town. I mean, maybe that's just because I'm a woman, right? But, like, I, the as soon as Tim, I talked to Tim the other day. As soon as he told me that, I was like, well, this woman has clearly been wronged, and she's right. the sympathetic party in all of right. this. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, but but yeah. but we don't. I mean, part of that came out because we we. I mean. We, we decided to do some investigating. We decided to do some poking yeah. around to kind of put okay. those pieces together you, because it, it would have been possible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could have just you gone were. right out to the keep without really kind of yeah. going Got into it. that. And, and, and yeah. especially if we had kind of landed, I was also thinking it would be a very different narrative if we had just gone straight to the keep and had gotten into the, the node dealing with the bandits first. Right. Right. Um, Without without having some of those other kind of key pieces, uh, you know, put together prior to that, right? That that we would have probably been drawing a whole set of other conclusions, uh, or had you, you gone know. direct? Yeah. First of all, when you did have the legend right up front, I did tell you about why the keep had been sealed up. So that so so to Tracy's point, you would have had the woman wanders in the town with demon baby is run out sealed up right away without any investigating. Also, if you would have gone to Tristan, Tristan would not necessarily have played his hand right away. He would have told you that there are monsters upstairs, right? He would have been like, if you, if you, if, if, if he, if he'd not just, you know, attacked you with his guys, if you got to the point where you're talking to Tristan, he's like, he's like, yes, we've made camp here. We've been trying to like, you know, I robbed the rich to give to the poor. And there are these monsters upstairs, right? He would have really sold you on the idea that, like, upstairs in this keep that he's barely holding at bay and under control, right, is is he would have really tried to sell you that, yeah, there's there's unnatural things here. And I am the only one keeping it under control, right? Like, you know, God forbid these creatures get out into the world, right? Um, which would have been a very different viewpoint on, on the situation. But given given what we came into the house knowing, I think I think I would have been pretty jaundiced in 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 hearing Tristan's Tristan's argument. I understand his argument, right? right. But I think I would I think I would struggle a little bit, yeah, to to buy it. The more Tristan yeah. talks, the worse. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, seems like you know, which is fine, you know. Yeah. I mean, to your guys' credits, you're, you're, you're all teachers, you're empathetic people, you care about like the next generation and, you know, in, instilling morals and values in people. I played with much bloodthirstier groups, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who would just see this as an opportunity to just, <laughs> yeah. you know, 
Exactly. What I like about this though is that like, because my students are those bloodthirsty groups, right? I get right. the D and D murder hobos who just want to go into a dungeon and just kill everything. And yeah. what I like about you know having these rich sorts of setups is that you can like, so unlike you, Jesse. I do have an agenda and I like to turn it on my students and you know yeah. if they kill some group of gnolls oh well it turns out that group of gnolls was friends with these people over here and now they're going right. to you know so it's 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 a well so I'm, I, I'm sure yeah I mean I'm certainly going to visit the consequences of anything you know if somebody were to mobile up, you know they like okay well you do this and now like yeah you're right all these poor people are now starving because you know you killed Tristan and well like like I wouldn't just like let it slide per se but that would be explored in the evolution of the fiction like okay now you've done this here is right here's what happens like one of the things that i think about that i would put in deeper notes to to ryan Swain is that uh the demon downstairs will happily undo jasmine's curse in exchange for his son like he'll be like oh yeah like he'd even restore her to her youth and she could just live her life over again she'd get a do-over if he's allowed to take various Right. Yeah, but uh, the hell with that, because what about Various's agency? Right, exactly. Like, the, the, right. this whole thing is about a tangled web of, of, of people violating each other's agency, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, but with various states of fantastical weirdness, right? We have fully human, half demon, fully demon, was human, now undead, right? Like, you know, like, at what point, like, what... What what are the metaphysics here, and what do those mean to you, right? Which is almost purely an emotional decision because none of that's real. So, <laughs> I think it might. I mean, I don't know if you'd planned on putting this in the zine at all, Jesse, but it like it might. In addition to like, because this. I'm, I'm looking very much looking forward to digging into this framework and again seeing what I can steal um, with with credit, of course. Um, but like another thing that might be nice to see in the notes is just kind of because I still get the feeling, and this might go to what John's getting at, is that like I think you kind of read the room, you knew what kind of players we were, mm -hmm. and you gave us a story we wanted, right? Mm -hmm. Like you saw that we weren't murder hobos, you saw that like we were starting to lean towards various, that we were kind of against. Uh, Tristan. I mean, Tristan could have been far more sympathetic than he was, but he wasn't, mm. right? So, I mean, it might be nice in your, like, in the zine, in the notes to kind of, if you just kind of talked about your process of, of running a game as well, like, in these sorts of charged scenarios, you know? Yeah. Um, There's a little bit of that sprinkled out throughout the text where I say, like, things like, this is the place in the text where I say things like, when you're using this kind of encounter, you want to be thinking about this kind of thing. Um, you know, this is this is here to express this idea. Like, I actually break down major encounter types. Like, I explain, I used an example of this. For example, I explain how traps um, can be used as a form of foreshadowing because traps have two purposes. One, they're they're there for a reason, right? Um, so they reveal the what I call the values of their builder, right? The trap is protecting something or doing something that, that somebody uh, values, and it reflects the nature of their maker. Like in this case, this is a bandit, so he builds, you know, a pit, a basic pit trap, you know, nails it down with iron and spikes. This, the birds at the stairs were effective, uh, effectively another version of that, but but various is a, is a doll maker. So that trap or whatever you want to call it reflects the fact that he's trying to protect upstairs so whatever he's trying to protect it's upstairs and it you know and it and it reflects who he is he's a, he's a puppet maker right so there's some of that through i don't i don't really have a section that's like how to really bring this home because admittedly i you know i often refer to those as the just be me section um i don't know how to explain in depth except to kind of point you at it as I'm explaining these other components. So there is some text that speaks to that that's like, here's how you use this thing, here's the questions to be thinking about, you know, don't do this to the players, try to use this this way, you know. Um, I talk a lot about, you know, villains and their motives and, you know, understanding them. I talk about the idea of, you know, monsters as the byproduct of human problems, you know. Uh, and so I, there's there's certainly a lot of 
guidance, if not like a, a treaty on, <laughs> you know, how to execute this, <laughs> which is maybe the best I can do. <laughs> it, it sounds interesting to me, so I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's moving along. It's, it, it, it'll get done. I mean, it, it's funny because. So when I ran my thing last month for the Ludoverse lab, it gave me ideas to go in one direction, but now I'm looking at your notes and having played this, I'm like, I don't want this direction now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's funny, yeah. The way in which, Brian, your, your work could be informed by this work yeah, very strongly, right? I mean, I, that's where my head was yeah. going like, wow, if Ryan had designed using some of this, some of these principles that would have made that experience even richer. I mean, right? well, I'm looking at, so I'm looking at this and on the one hand, I'm thinking like, I would really have to scale back this kind of setup that Jesse's created to make this work the way that I do it. And then on the other hand, I'm like, well, what if instead of it being discrete adventures every, you know, class or two, it's one adventure that stretches out the entire semester. Precisely. And, and then these rooms, the way like that node set up that Jesse had, it's kind of like, well, those clusters are my topics, right? And so it's yeah. not that we're going to we're not going to several different dungeons and having several different encounters. It's that no, the 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 entire semester takes place in this one dungeon and each of these clusters are the different topics. And so yeah, that's I'm having the same thought process as I'm looking at this. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you yeah. know, weeks before the semester begins, how can I now just redesign my whole semester? Um, <laughs> That's uh, I'm flattered, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, these, these node clusters are, are, are and, and sort of building, building narrative ideas around those clusters is, is one of the key things. In fact, last night I was working on it, and I, I just added the example node maps, and I'd actually reordered them to introduce the cluster idea sooner than I had, because I think it's actually more important than even the concept of critical paths, which is what I was, like, I basically went from entrance to, oh, and then, like, here's where you place, like, a boss node, and, like, you can look at the, you know, the, the distances or whatever, and then I was like, no, actually, I think the topical organization of the nodes are more important, so I moved, I moved that up in the text um uh, yeah yeah and and yeah. you know another thing that that i think makes this work so well and that makes it so rich is that okay yeah in some ways yes it is one adventure but then feeding into that that there's really a a a pretty complicated set of relationships that you know gets revealed to you so you know you have the destitute in the town who are being benefited by uh uh, by Tristan, uh, you know, you have the, the the magistrate and and just the 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 town leaders who have their set of 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 uh, concerns. You have the wealthy families who are being victimized. Then we have, you know, Jasna who has her own kind of uh, mindset. You have uh, Various uh, who is you know has has a slightly different set of concerns, uh, and then. You know, if we had met the demon, really, I mean, it, it keeps on kind of building. So it's a, a very, um, you know, and if you have players who have, uh, you know, a little bit of empathy, right? I mean, the way that you're kind of approaching the different, uh, you know, individuals and groups and, you know, even giving the monsters, you know, uh, their own kind of set of clear motivations. Yeah, kind of, uh, it, it's it's a very complicated web, which then, you know, for the players, I think makes it very uh rich and 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 very kind of fraught in terms of of deciding how how exactly are you gonna kind of have everything work out in the end yeah i said the the, the whole point was to try and find a median ground between the sort of purely character driven drama of a game like dogs in the vineyard and the ease and sort of simplicity of dungeon exploration, right? Again, I said that one of like a lot of people who are, are negative about D D or whatever, like I think missed the point that it's an easy concept. You have you're a bunch of adventurers. There's a dangerous, there's a cool, fascinating, dangerous place over there to explore. 
that's easy, right? Like a lot of people get caught up in like, oh, but I have all these powers and numbers. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look at the structure of the game. The game is some dude at the head of the table tells me some weird, cool thing I'm exploring and I just tell him what I do and he tells me what happens. That's easy and fun and interesting. So I was like, okay. So I get it. Some people are like, oh yeah, random encounters are so boring or just like fighting, you know, you know, whatever enemies or whatever. I'm like, okay, but yeah, but that just means you're building boring dungeons. <laughs> right. Here's, here's how to build, right? Here's how to, here's how to preserve the structure. Cool. I go in, there's a trap, there's a weird monster, there's rats in the basements, there's a demon, there's a vampire. Here's how to preserve all of that. Right. <laughs> And just make it more interesting, <laughs> right? Just make it matter, right? Yeah. You don't have to throw the format out, you know, just because you want something a little deeper. You can make the format deeper. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when, as we're wrapping up here, uh, just kind of curious as to any other kind of comments that you have uh, on this. I, I think this is, uh, for me, was was a, a very provocative uh uh, experience and and Jesse, I also very much appreciate you taking the time out at the end here to kind of take us through the the kind of uh, thinking, the thought process, and the you know some of the tricks that you have up your sleeve to to kind of put all of this all of this together. Yeah, I mean, I was happy to do this. So, you know, so I was sort of honored. So thank you very much for even giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, my brain is, um, I've been pretty quiet, but my brain is sort of working in overdrive, um, just listening to everyone talk. And I've been thinking a lot about global issues because of, you know, as soon as I saw the, the web, um, that Jesse had drawn, I immediately went to global issues because that's what global issues are, right? Everything is interconnected. This connects to this and this, you know, um, and and then when he when you were talking about traps, Jesse, and and who mm. set the trap and why they set it, my brain it sort of like started clicking into like some weird place about what kind of traps do do the systems we have in place set for people, right? Like what okay. kinds of social traps do we have for people? What kinds of economic traps do we have for people set out in the world? And then just a minute ago, I was thinking, do I set traps for my students? <laughs> you know what I mean? But like all of a sudden I'm thinking of everything as the, like, but you're right, right? Like that pit trap was made by a bandit, right? Yeah. So what kind of trap do capitalists set? Okay. Right? All right. For for the people, right? Like that's that's just what I'm thinking about now. And I just my brain is is trying to expand out of my head right now and think about global issues and, and these things. It's not going very well right now, but I think in the next couple of days, it might coalesce into something. Yeah, uh, this has been quite the treat because like, you know, I, I am but a humble programmer. Um, and and you guys like, like, uh, it's just so exciting because you guys were taking this to like a level that like even I wasn't thinking about, like <laughs> Ryan's whole things about like, what is the nature of unnatural things? And now Tracy's talking about, global systems and trash and I'm like, I, I just had a story about an abused vampire woman. Well, but <laughs> even in that, guys... right? Like even if you're an abused woman, right? Like yeah. there are traps set for women all over the place right. all the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I women navigate it, traps yeah. every day. Which yeah. is which is, you know, the point of this. Um uh, yeah. Uh which is which is very much, you know, a lot of the inspiration for this, which is uh, yeah, in my opinion, you know, Jasna is, is horribly abused. Uh, but at the end of the day, she's also currently stuck in a state of being a bloodthirsty vampire. Like, what right. do you do about that? Like, right. what do you what do you do when an abused person is so abused they're now effectively a monster themselves, right? Like, that's kind of yeah. the, well, and, and yeah. I mean that that yeah. that that happens in society. I mean, you, you know, there right. are certainly people who have been you know who have grown up in terribly abusive situations, and they end up being a uh, very antisocial dangerous yep. people and mm -hmm. and right if you if you take the time to kind of uh learn about their their upbringing i mean it, it it does build empathy for them but at the same time i mean if 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 they are not able to 
deal with society in any kind of, of healthy or, uh, you know, effective way. I mean, that, that, you know, you, you can't, with some of those, you can't just let them run amok, uh, you know, as, as bad as you feel for them, right? I mean, that you have to find some way to kind of protect society as well. Right. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Jasmine and various story is essentially uh, retributive versus restorative justice. Right. But, I mean, that's, that's basically what it is to me, right? And the, 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 the Tristan story becomes a, um, uh, you know, what, what kinds of, what, what kinds of policy have the equivalent of, of actually providing productive, socially good benefit versus those ones that we think maybe do, but we haven't really thought about it carefully enough and actually are problematic in some way or another that actually make things worse. Um, so it becomes sort of, you know, like a, I mean, again, I'm taking it out of the game and into a kind of sure, uh, sure. You know, but that's a well, I mean, that's, policy analyst question. What I what I absolutely love about role playing games, honestly, is the opportunity to explore that kind of stuff in an indirect way. Like, I love the fact that you guys are giving voice to it in a more direct, you know, way because you're all educators and you all have these, you know, big views. But the nice thing about this is that we can. We can we can do this deep discussion, but purely expressed through fictional action, right? Mm -hmm. Those questions are going to come up in the back of the mind of the players, whether or not they could apply those terms, talk about you know policy or you know metaphysics or whatever. They're gonna they're gonna experience those issues on a raw emotional level, right? They're gonna come into this situation and they're gonna have a feeling about it one way or another, whether it's just pure horror, everything here should be destroyed, or whether it's sympathy or you know, whether it's like, how can I leverage this to my advantage, right? They're gonna be making those decisions, even if they're not conscious of the bigger, perhaps ramification or applications of those decisions. And honestly, that's why I like role-playing as a medium, mm -hmm. is to do that in a sort of one step removed from actually sitting around having, you know, <laughs> philosophical <laughs> conversations, right? The metaphor of, you know, vampires and demons and, uh, you know, relationships sort of lubricates that conversation in a, in a more fun, experimental, experiential way, rather than like a you know, deep thinky conversational one. Um, although I certainly hope that anybody who plays this scenario, get, you know, walks away with it sort of still rattling around in their head. So why don't I uh, kind of wrap this up and uh, I want to just thank everybody uh, for coming and uh, giving up some of your Saturdays to to uh, go through this and uh, have the experience and again Jesse we we really appreciate you bringing this to the table I, I think uh, all of us you know were uh, wowed by it and and also as teachers I think that we're kind of uh, we're always sponges, right? And there's there's a lot of like yeah. really valuable ideas here. And you know what you were saying about role playing games is 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 why in in the context of the classroom, why I one of the reasons why I've been kind of interested because mm -hmm. I, I I think with the students, you know, having some type of I mean, students want to have those those deep conversations, but when they're just first coming into it, they need to have some experiences. They need to have something mm -hmm. that will engage them and that will get them kind of actively involved. And so something like this, where, you know, I could see students kind of working things out just in, in, in terms of an adventure, but then kind of breaking from it and then having all of that kind of experience to kind of think about and kind of, kind of frame things for them, I think is very, very useful. Uh, and Jesse, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Right. See you all soon. Stay safe, Bye. everybody. Bye. Well. Bye. Bye.